folks, Dr. Austin's Al here. Uh, we're going to finish up our little talk about the populace. They're going to, well, kind of go away for now. Um, uh, they're going to politicize their movement. Uh, they're going to call it the People's Party or the Populist Party. Uh, they're going to be strongest to the peak uh, in the election of 1892. Uh, they're going to be co-opted in 1896. And for the most part, they'll disappear in most parts of the country. Uh, they'll still be successful uh, in the sense that they're going to win elections uh, out west, uh, places like Idaho, Washington, uh, and Oregon. Um, the, the People's Party, the will come together, at least elements will be in, um, uh, in Cleburne, Texas, um, and the representatives will, will come up with three big ideas, transportation, land, and a monetary system, one transportation. They'll demand that the federal government regulate the railroad rates. Now, certain uh, states had been successful in doing so, most uh, notably uh, Illinois. Uh, there was a lawsuit uh, that forced railroads in the state of Illinois uh, to regulate um, railroad rates. And so uh, transportation uh, demand uh, is in, in Cleburne is about that, and nationalize, or, and, and to, 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 to standardize the railroad rates nationally. Uh, two is land. Um, this is about selling uh, land um, to uh, individuals uh, over railroads, um, selling it as, as cheap to uh, uh, individuals as, as to the railroads. And here's where it smacks of xenophobia. Uh, the federal government cannot sell land to foreigners. Of course, today that doesn't happen. We don't really care uh, who buys the land uh, as long as the uh, as long as the check uh, clears the bank. Uh, and finally, we have uh, the monetary system. Uh, they wanted a a, um, a bimetallic monetary system, monetary system backed by both gold and silver. Um, until the Nixon administration, until the early 1970s, uh, the country will be on what they called the gold standard, meaning um, if you had a $100, uh, there would be $100 of gold in some you know, federal bank somewhere. Um, and so when the government printed money, for the most part, uh, the government held that amount of gold. That's how this country maintained um, uh, a, a, a currency uh, that was neither uh, too inflated or, or, or too deflated. You know, trying to make it just, um, we're not on the gold standard anymore. It was, it was, it was silly um, uh, after World War II because the world wants American money. Um, and in 1887, a guy named Charles McCune will, will add another issue, and that's the sub-treasury. The sub-treasury is this. Uh, they want the federal government to help farmers uh, in getting the highest price possible for their farm goods. Um, when you have farmers, people in a certain area tend to farm the same stuff. You know, the soil, the weather, the terrain uh, will, will facilitate the same crop uh, growing best. So uh, farmers in a certain area, for example, all, all, all grow wheat. Well, if all those farmers uh, put their product on the market at the same time, the price is going to drop. Uh, good for consumers, bad for farmers. And so what the sub-treasure system was in, in part is the federal government would, 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 would create and maintain these warehouses in which farmers would put their grain in the warehouses, get a loan from the federal government for the value of the wheat at a tiny, tiny, tiny interest rate. Um, and then the farmers would sell their wheat when the market is highest. Um, so there's a there's a little bit of, um, of federal government uh, control uh, in, uh, in the economy, at least uh, in the ag business, which, 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 which of course is, is, is part of our national economy today. Uh, farmers, both individual and, and, and factory farmers, commercial farming, uh, gets tremendous subsidies, tremendous uh, corporate welfare. Um, they get a lot of money for us. Ah. Uh, one of the uh, few um, nationally known, very popular uh, female um, speakers uh, in support of uh, the farmers was this woman, Mary Elizabeth Lease. Uh, one of her famous quotes is, raise less hay and more hell. Here is a, a rendition, uh, part of one of her favorite, or, uh, one of her more popular, oops, that, one of her more popular 
uh, numbers in, oh, there it is. Um, uh, the actress's name, uh, Frances McDormand, um, you may have recognized her from various movies. The mechanization of farming in the late 19th century forced small farmers to borrow money to pay rent for their equipment. When they could not pay, their farms were taken away. They began to organize, forming the populist movement of the 1880s and 1890s. Here are the words of one of its most important leaders, Mary Elizabeth Lease. When was that, Anthony? <laughs> well, it was 1890. Thank you. <laughs> this is a nation of inconsistencies. The Puritans fleeing from oppression became oppressors. We fought England for our liberty and put chains on four million of blacks. The great common people of this country are slaves, and monopoly is the master. Wall Street owns the country. It is no longer a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, but a government of Wall Street, by Wall Street, and for... <laughs> money rules. Our laws are the output of a system which clothes rascals in robes and honesty in rags. The parties lie to us and the political speakers mislead us. Mm. We were told two years ago to go to work and raise a big crop. That was all we needed. We went to work and plowed and planted. The rains fell, the sun shone, nature smiled, and we raised the big crop that they told us to. And what came of it? Eight cent corn, 10 cent oats, two cent beef, and no price at all for butter and eggs. That's what came of it. Then the politician said we suffered from overproduction. Overproduction? When 10,000 little children, so statistics tell us, starve to death every year in the United States of America. We want money, land, and transportation. We want the accursed foreclosure system wiped out. We still stand by our homes. We will not pay our debts to the loan shark companies until the government pays its debts to us. The people are at bay, so let the bloodhounds of money beware. You have a hard time finding anything in her speech that uh, that does not uh, ring true uh, in um, presentations today of um, activists who are trying to um, get government to be more responsive to the needs of people. Um, in 1890, uh, a group of farmers uh, from all over the United States um, met in, um, I'm sorry, uh, let me take that back. Uh, in 1890, uh, farmers in Kansas uh, met and created what they called uh, the Alliance Ticket. Uh, and they ran for a whole bunch of positions from local dog catcher um, to governor. And, and, and they won many, many, many positions. Uh, their, their, their success uh, resulted in two years later uh, with farmers from all over the country a meeting in Omaha, Nebraska. Now, Omaha, Nebraska was, of course, picked uh, on, uh, on purpose. Uh, it is relatively the geographic center of the United States and, and, uh, and because of uh, the farming culture. Um, uh, leaders such as uh, L.L. Polk and Ignatius Donnelly uh, spoke about the need for farmers to rise up and uh, uh, lead a second American revolution, uh, to take control of the government, uh, to, uh, to lead the people to prosperity. But they added a few extra things. Uh, they called for a graduated workday. I'm sorry, they called for an eight-hour workday. And, and, and that, they're, they're clearly trying to win support of factory workers. They're trying to expand this, this, this political ideology uh, into the urban centers. 
Now, um, Americans were working, you know, 12 to 16 hour days. And so the question is, why would you work 12 to 16 hour days? Well, one, because you have to, okay, that's, that's the shift. That's, that's what's required. But the other answer is because you have to, it took 12 to 16 hours of work per day to meet the rent, to buy the food, to pay the bills. And so if you're going to call for an eight hour workday, it sounds nice, but the reality is that means you're going to be losing money. That must, that may mean a tremendous hit to your family income. Um, I have my full-time job, um, which is a, a, a nine, nine month contract. Um, but then I do extra work uh, for the college. Um, and I actually work, um, 10 and a half months a year. I, I teach additional uh, courses. Um, I think I'm paid really well, but I like money. I need more of it, have all sorts of stuff to do. Uh, savings accounts for uh, our son for college and vacations and putting on a new roof and all sorts of things. Um, well, same thing here. So you're going to limit people's income? That's problematic. Uh, they did call for a graduate income tax, which is interesting. That's, that's the income tax that we relatively have today. Uh, their idea of a graduate income tax, however, was, was very simple. Uh, the more you earn, the more you had to pay. Uh, today, of course, that's not uh, true at all. Um, now, uh, the, the more you make, the more loopholes, uh, the more deductions that you have. Uh, the more you make, uh, the more you can uh, pay um, um, uh, attorneys, uh, accountants, uh, to find ways not to, uh, to pay uh, taxes. Uh, the person uh, who was currently uh, in the White House, uh, at least of August of 2018, um, according to the New York Times, uh, paid zero income tax uh, for a number of years, which I, I talked about uh, very on, on the first, first day or so um, of the semester. So um, I did not pay zero in income tax over that same period. Um, they also called for the popular election of senators, which we have today. They, at Americans at that time, did not popularly elect their senators. Uh, and, and, and instead, uh, Americans would elect their, um, uh, their state representatives who would then decide who uh, becomes uh, the senator. Um, things like a graduate income tax and the popular election of senators and a whole bunch of other stuff will eventually be picked up by uh, the next group called, called, called the progressives. Um, so uh, one big question is, uh, did, did the progressives, I'm sorry, uh, uh, did, uh, did the populace fail? It depends on what you looked at. If you go to 1896, the answer is yes, they failed. But if you take that beyond that, say 10 or 15 years, the answer is yes, they succeeded. Because so many of the ideas of the People's Party or the populace will be picked up by the next group, the progressives, uh, who will carry the baton across the finish line. Okay, um, we had uh, the two-party system for many decades. Um, it was uh, the Democrats and the Whigs, and then the Democrats and the Republicans. Yes, there, there, there were other parties, just like there are other parties today, okay? Um, but they just don't get elected. Okay. If anything, they take votes away um, from uh, a national um, figure who could have won. Uh, I'll give you a good example. Uh, the governor of, uh, of Arkansas, Bill Clinton, uh, the Democrat, went up against uh, the sitting president, George H.W. Bush, uh, in 1992. And then there was a third party candidate. And the third party candidate actually took votes away from Bush. Um, without that third party candidate, Bush would have relatively easily won re-election. Nope, that wasn't the case. And, and Clinton becomes president. Uh, there was a third party candidate in, in the year 2000 uh, who took votes away from, uh, from the Democratic candidate. And, and the Democratic candidate, even though he won the popular vote, uh, will, uh, he'll, he'll lose the, uh, the election in, in, in part because the Supreme Court uh, will hand the election over by one vote to, to the loser of the popular vote, Bush. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, so here we go. Uh, the third party system just doesn't work. Anyhow, uh, their 1892 platform is this. 
money, transportation, land. Okay, they're sticking to the Cleburne de demands. Here's what the Democrats want, free trade, okay? Pro-business, the Sherman Antitrust Act, so they're going to go after monopolies and buy uh, metallism, which means um, paper money backed by both gold and silver. The Republicans want high tariffs, protective tariffs. Ugh. historically they never work. If anything, that they've caused uh, economic disruption uh, in this country. Um, George Washington was the first president to call for free trade. Um, most presidents called for free trade. Most presidents had economic advisors or had their own, their own ability uh, to, to read a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet today, and, and, and realize that uh, when the world wants American goods, American economy succeeds. Um, even when uh, uh, China is, is dumping more of their products here, um, that still means that American dollars are sitting in Chinese banks, which is really good for the American economy. And so um, Woodrow Wilson is, is going to be the, the first major proponent of uh, free trade uh, after we get rid of all these uh, these uh, protectionist uh, Republicans, um, and, and and free trade becomes the watchword of Republican or Democratic presidents all the way up until recently. Tariffs don't work. Historically, they have not. They support the Monroe Doctrine, which is also protectionist. Uh, what they're saying is is that is that Europe is going to uh, get involved in, in our affairs, or that our affairs are um, uh, protecting Latin America, but they also support by metallism. So here's here's the, here's the main difference, folks, between the Democrats and the Republicans. Uh, where's my cursor? Where'd it go? There it is. Uh, free trade by the Democrats, high tariff. Okay, two very different ideas. Uh, 1896. I'm sorry. The um, the uh, the uh, uh, the uh, Republicans win uh, in 1896, uh, 1892, uh, 1896. Uh, really, the the sole issue for the populist is silver. Um, really, that's it. Um, and 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 we have uh, William Jennings uh, versus um, uh, William uh, McKinley. Um, here, here's McKinley: uh, prosperity at home, prestige abroad, commerce and civilization. Interesting. Civilization. Huh. Um, here's a speech. Well, here is the voice uh, of, uh, where is it? Right here, of, of, of William Jennings Bryan. We care not upon what line the battle is fought. If they say bimetallism is good, but that we cannot have it until other nations help us, we reply that instead of having a gold standard, because England has, we will restore bimetallism, and then let England have bimetallism because the United States has. If they dare to come out in the open field and defend the gold standards, the good thing, we will fight them to the uttermost. Having behind us the producing masses of this nation and the world, supported by the commercial interests, the laboring interests, and the toilers everywhere, we will answer their demand for a gold standard by saying to them, you shall not press down upon the brow of labor this crown of thorns. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold. Um, the way he talks, you know, what he says that is interesting. Uh, but the way he talks, it's known as the, uh, um, uh, as the transatlantic accent. Um, American elite, and, and once we finally get uh, the, the, the establishment of, of Hollywood, uh, and, and, and then movies as, as part of American popular culture in, in the 30s and 40s, um, you're going to hear that accent. Um, that's not how they talk. Actors will talk like this. But when the cameras will roll, they will speak this transatlantic accent. What it is is um, the, the elongation of vowels, uh, which, which is a little introduction of a British accent. Um, that accent was seen in the United States going back to the 1880s and 1890s as an accent of the educated, as an accent of um, uh, the, the, the elite, um, uh, the social elite. 
And so uh, we're going to see that uh, being being very popular uh, later on in, uh, in in American popular culture. Uh, after World War II, however, that's going to disappear. That is going to be gone. Gone, daddy, gone. Um, McKinley is, is running on, on your very traditional uh, Republican platform, uh, as always, uh, high tariffs, um, protectionist economy. Um, the problem is both the Democrats and the populists support William Jennings Bryan. Uh, and so <laughs> who to vote for? Okay, once again, you don't vote for the person, you vote for the party. So you're going to split his vote. Um, and in reality, the the People's Party or, or the populace became so watered down by 1896. They they tried to appeal to so many voters that uh, that they really looked like the Republicans or the Democrats, who were also so diverse. And, um, and a lot of the stuff that the uh, that the People's Party talked about in the 1892 election, or even uh, the uh, the Cleburne demands, for example, or what they talked about uh, in um, 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 in Omaha, um, was simply absorbed by the Republicans and the Democrats. So there was no reason to vote for a third party because the stuff that the third party had originally talked about is being now supported by the establishment. So that was it. Like I said, folks, the, the, the populist as a national party came to an end as a result of the election or after the election of 1896. And they're still going to be successful out west, but oh well. Um, and so what happened to populists? Well, there's all sorts of different ideas. Um, certainly the label of populist will continue throughout the 20th century. There's going to be a lot of pol politicians who call themselves populist. There's going to be a lot of um, uh, a media who will refer to uh, politicians as populist. In the 2016 election, uh, both uh, Bernie Sanders and, and Donald Trump will portray themselves as populist. Now, there's two very different strands here. We had Bernie Sanders who, who, uh, who talked about, uh, about, about social assistance, about economic assistance, um, about, about helping people, about extending uh, health care. Uh, that, that people should have the right uh, to, to be taken care of. You know, a, 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 a Christian country, as, as the United States claims to be, uh, should be looking out for the least um, of their citizens. Um, uh, that an educated uh, population uh, results in a, uh, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a more uh, educated workforce. Um, and, and, um, in a more politically astute voting population. And, and so he, he called for assistance for, um, for people in college and just a whole bunch of stuff, uh, general assistance for Americans. On the other hand, you had Donald Trump, uh, who talked about the evils of immigrants and especially Muslims and Spanish-speaking people, um, who he called rapists and murderers, as, as I talked about earlier on, um, that, uh, that they're taking our jobs. Um, and as you know, uh, the people didn't buy that argument. Uh, they supported Hillary Clinton's vision of America, but because of the, uh, the electoral college, um, things ended up uh, differently as, uh, as I found out. And um, uh, we'll see how things unfold. But the, the populist um, title uh, continues on. Okay. Uh, just because the populist party disappeared uh, doesn't mean that the that the badge of, of populism has has disappeared. Um, this is a poster from uh, from the 1896 um, Republican um, or the, the election of 1896. Here's McKinley. Here's his vice president candidate Garrett Hobart. Who the hell is Hobart? Eh, well, that was his first uh, vice presidential uh, candidate. Um, he's going to be uh, replaced by a guy named Teddy Roosevelt, which is going to be good for Teddy Roosevelt, which we'll talk about why. Okay, here we go. Protection versus free trade. When you protect the United States, i.e. high tariffs, look what happens. Uncle Sam, I guess, uh, climbs a flag and the factories are in operation 
And look at the family. Look how well dressed they are. She has a fur on. He has a cane and a top hat. Uh, the top hat has traditionally been viewed in American society as as wealth. Okay. Um, the last American president to wear this elite hat uh, was John F. Kennedy in his inauguration uh, in, in, in 1961. Um, look at the little girl. Look at how well she's dressed and she has shoes on. And she's looking at the, at, at, at the beehive, okay? Look at here. What happens when we have free trade? Oh, no. His elite hat is gone. He doesn't have a cane. He doesn't have a jacket. Everybody, oh, she's not wearing shoes. She's super sad. The beehive is not going over the bees. There's a wolf. Oh, my God. Uh, and the factory. The factory is shuttered. It's closed down. And this little guy, oh, man, he's selling everything off. Holy cow. Damn. Look at this guy. He's super happy. Prices of wheat, 125. Right? You heard? You heard how much wheat was? This is what happens, folks. High tariffs result in low prices. Because what happens when you slap up a tariff? As if you've been paying attention, the other country slaps up a tariff itself. Yep, yep, yep. For its American consumers. So, what happened? Um, too many problems. Uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the Farmers Alliance refused to allow uh, black farmers or, or, or women farmers into their group. So, uh, they created the Black Farmers Alliance and, and the Women's Farmers Alliance. Um, they were way too, too diverse in, in, in their ideology. It was just, they tried to appeal to everybody, and that's not going to work. Okay? They didn't capture the vote of the labor and, 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 and the needs of farmers and the needs of labor were, were really not connected, not in reality. And, and certainly they did not make uh, the connection. And, and, and I think the big reason why the populace failed is because the American people were more in step with Sumner's vision. And Sumner's vision was this. Uh, William Graham Sumner was a sociologist. I forget which university. Was it Harvard or Yale or Columbia? A big one. Anyhow, he talked there and he came out with his book in 1883 called What the Social Classes Owe to Each Other. And in a nutshell, it was nothing that you are who you are because that's what you are. That's just cold evolution. Social Darwinism. Okay. If you're wealthy, that's that's simply nature's, you know, working out of things. If you're poor, hey man, that's the way it goes. But you can't help it. Okay, that's just here. A drunkard in the gutter is just where he ought to be, according to the fitness and tendency of things. Nature has set upon him the process of decline and disillusion by which she resolves things which have survived their usefulness. So, in other words, uh, nature is trying to uh, remove uh, this problem. On the other side, the millionaires are the product of natural selection. The, the naturally selected agents of society for certain work, they get high wages and live in luxury. But the bargain is a good one for society. Okay. So the wealthy are wealthy because they're wealthy and that's good for society. Well, let's see if other, let's see if this ideology exists today. Well, of course, the answer is yes, otherwise it wouldn't have a slide here. Uh, ben Carson uh, is, as of this time, uh, uh, August 18th, 2018, uh, the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, and his job is to make sure that really poor people are getting uh, proper, uh, clean, safe housing. Uh, his job is to uh, 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 dole out uh, money uh, to to states uh, to uh, to assist uh, poor people, and 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 then this is what he says that poverty is a state of mind that you are poor because you think you're poor. That kind of smacks of Sumner. Here's a uh, Congressman Paul Ryan who is a uh, um, well the Speaker of the House. He's third in line for the presidency. Okay, he talks about the problem of quote. Lazy inner city men. Huh. What are we talking about? Black guys. Okay. And then three, Trump is clearly paraphrasing Sumner when he talks about the necessity of surrounding himself with, with, with fellow billionaires. So 
let's listen to what these three guys had to say, which is, uh, which is uh, Sumner's ideas alive and well in the 21st century. First, Carson. As much I think that I don't not I, I I'll move on, Mr. Carson. I accept the, your lack of knowledge. Now, Mr. Carson, <clears throat> there seems to be a belief among the ranks of those who have opportunities to help others who have been blessed themselves. They seem to think that the rich need more, that the poor can do more with less, but the rich will have to have more to do more. Mr. Carson, if poor people could do more with less, there would be no poor people. Poor people are not poor because they choose to be. I know about your state of mind comment, but they're not poor because they choose to be poor. Have you not noticed, just for edification purposes, and I'm sure that you're aware of it, but there may be people who are listening who are not. Black unemployment, Mr. Carson, is always, with some exceptions, about twice that of white unemployment. There are many reasons for this, but that fact has a lot to do with what people can do with money that they have and what they can't do with the money that they don't have. There are other factors involved in this country other than a state of mind. There is still, Mr. Carson, invidious discrimination in the United States of America. While you may not suffer it, there are others who do. And they need to know what you plan to do, and I regret that you're unable to tell us today. I yield back the balance of my time, Mr. Chairman. The positions that you ascribe to me are your opinion of what I think. They're not what I think. Mr. Chairman, Chairman if he chooses to respond and say this, I'd then the ask that I be allowed to let him know that um, my positions the time are what you the gentleman articulated and did not articulate. The chair now recognizes the... Here's about Paul Ryan. Good morning, I'm Melissa Harris-Perry. Over the past few weeks, an important public debate has been taking place online about race, culture, and poverty. Now, the principals are two very smart people who write for two well-regarded magazines. This is Jonathan Chait, a writer for New York Magazine, a self-professed liberal who writes about politics and media. This is ta Coates, national correspondent for The Atlantic. Now, I should disclose that he once described me as America's foremost public intellectual, which was not only an overstatement, but also a designation far more descriptive of the prolific Coates himself. So those are the interlocutors. And here is what sparked the debate. This is Congressman Paul Ryan on March 12th. We have got this tailspin of culture in our inner cities in particular of men not working and just generations of men not even thinking about working or learning the value and the culture of work. And so there's a real culture problem here that has to be dealt with. The backlash to Ryan's comments was swift. Congresswoman Barbara Lee described them as a thinly veiled racial attack, and progressive commentators pointed to the hypocrisy of Ryan's insistence on cultural explanations for poverty while advancing policies that deepen inequality. And as is frequently the case, Ta-Nehisi Coates on March 18th made a contribution to this discussion that was especially insightful. He pointed to the discursive similarities between Congressman Ryan's culture statement and President Obama's repeated invocations of Cousin Pookie when talking to black audiences about how to lessen inequality. Now, Coates was less interested in lamb-blasting this president in particular than in reminding us about the slippery assumptions about blackness, poverty, and cultural deficiency that are ubiquitous. White conservatives do this pathologizing, of course. Just look at Congressman Ryan. White liberals do it. See President Clinton's determination to end welfare as we knew it. Black conservatives do it. Just look at the new black conservative magazine, American Current C, whose stated mission is, quote, transcending race through delivering the awareness of a culture free of government dependency. As Coach was pointing out, even black liberals tend to conflate poverty with pathology, even President Obama. Here is the president announcing the My Brother's Keeper initiative in February, a program designed to remove the structural obstacles to success for young men of color. 
Yes, we need to train our workers, invest in our schools, make college more affordable, and government has a role to play. And yes, we need to encourage fathers to stick around and remove the barriers to marriage and talk openly about things like responsibility and faith and community. In the words of Dr. King, it is not either or, it is both and. So are you still with me? Conservative congressman invokes culture of poverty. Progressives cry foul. Smart cultural observer points out that the president is sometimes guilty of the same strategy. On March 19th, enter Jonathan Chait, who responded to Coates' piece by defending the idea that culture is, at least in part, responsible for the perpetuation of African-American poverty. He wrote, it would be bizarre to imagine that centuries of slavery, followed by systematic terrorism, segregation, discrimination, a legacy wealth gap, and so on, did not leave a cultural residue that itself became an impediment to success. Interesting, interesting. So, did Ryan uh, miss, miss, misspeak, or was the reaction uh, out of scope? Uh, meaning um, that sometimes when someone of the other party says something that you don't like, it's problematic without realizing that uh, that position is uh, sometimes uh, supported by your own party. Um, for example, why did Clinton say, uh, we're going to end uh, welfare as we know it? We'll get to that. Uh, okay, and finally, here's Trump uh, clearly uh, invoking that second quote I had about Sumner. The legendary Wall Street genius Wilbur Ross here. He's our Secretary of Commerce. We have... Gary Cohn, who is the president of Goldman Sachs. In fact, somebody, he's the president of Goldman Sachs. He had to pay over $200 million in taxes to take the job, right? So somebody said, why did you appoint a rich person to be in charge of the economy? I said, no, it's true. And Wilbur's a very rich person in charge of commerce. I said, because that's the kind of thinking we want. I mean, you know, really, because they're representing the country. They don't want the money. They're representing the country. And they had to give up a lot to take these jobs. They gave up a lot. When you get the president, this is the president of Goldman Sachs, smart. Having him represent us, he went from massive paydays to peanuts, to little tiny. I'm waiting for them to accuse him of wanting that little amount of money. They wanted that. But these are people that are great, brilliant business minds, and that's what we need. That's what we have to have. So the world doesn't take advantage of it. We can't have the world taking advantage of us anymore. So, oh, the great sacrifice of the billionaires for our country. So, what social classes owe to each other certainly continues, folks. The mentality of Sumner is alive and well. Um, the status quo of the Gilded Age was, was, was simply that. Um, so many Americans uh, bought into the idea that uh, there's nothing really you can do. Um, that a third party was, was irrational, uh, that it was un-American. We get our ideas on, on religion, on society, on politics uh, from our parents. And we don't walk away from those easily. Uh, we, we may become a little more liberal or, or a little more conservative as we grow up and, and, and develop, uh, but we, we traditionally, most of us stay within the spectrum. And so what the populists were asking Americans to do was to turn their backs on, on the party of their fathers. Not gonna happen, folks. Not, not, not overnight, not in the, in the short, short, short term uh, of the existence uh, of the populist party. Um, the other idea is that the hard work model is a bunch of nonsense. And people use the, that phrase and all its success is just hard work, hard work, hard work. Here's a, here's a quote from, a, from The Rock, okay? Success isn't always about greatness. I don't know what that means. It's about consistency. Constant hard work leads to success. Greatness will come. I don't know. Once again, I think the guys who mow my lawn work hard. I don't think what I do is hard work. It's time consuming. 
this takes a long time to put these together. So, I think the idea of hard work is nonsense. You know, think those immigrants worked hard? Lived horribly. I mean, numerous, numerous immigrants working, I'm sorry, living in a, in a one room, not one bedroom, a, a one room apartment. Because the reality is, the income that they made, they could not live by themselves. They could not afford to live by themselves. Tremendous sacrifice. Keep this nation's economy going. The hope that hard work would pay off, and for so many, that never happened. Folks, as always, you know how to get a hold of me. So for now, I will say, I'll see you when I see you. Bye.